Hi, Roger Hamilton here, CEO of Genius Group. Hold on tight, you're about to see the most mind-blowing interview. I just had this this week together with John Berda, who is the former CEO of Torchlight. So as many of you know, we have been attacked by short sellers at Genius Group. I was looking for support from other CEOs, uh, ideas, what they were doing. John Berta took his business, Torchlight, from the same place as us, 30 cents a share, $18 million convertible debt that they couldn't access, like being in a situation where it's like, hey, I can't raise money and I can't do anything with this list of company. Uh, what did he do? He ended up actually taking action, uh, announcing he was going to do a merger, finding a merger partner in Meta. And within six months, he went from 30 cents to $11.00. And he went from something like 4,000 shareholders to over 65,000 shareholders. Uh, he was able to raise the 18 million, then 25 million, then $140 million, all within six months. And on top of that, to close a $1.9 billion merger. Uh, just incredible story and uh, inspiration to every CEO, inspiration to every retail investor that we can beat these guys. So do watch the first half where he explains that and also exposes what $50 million of naked short sellers who actually come to him to try and get him to solve the problem for them. And then in the second half, something that's happening right now, many of you know about MMTLP. This is the Series A shares where John basically took the assets of Torchlight, which is the private oil and gas company, said, hey, we're going to just spin that off separately. And instead of just what should have been a simple thing to do, Wall Street got involved. Suddenly those shares started trading. Uh, Finra then actually blocked the completion of that deal. And it's right now happening. This was the week this week where John got together with some of the other uh, shareholders, came up with this idea of like creating a group called Flamethrower. And that is now suing uh, the parties involved, which which obviously means also taking legal action against FINRA. I mean, like this is bold moves. And so if you're right in the middle of something where you are either a CEO wondering what's happening to your company, your retail investor that's trying to figure out how to actually support the CEO, uh, watch this or send it to your CEO, because this is the kind of thing which is actually going to move mountains. Uh, we use a lot of the things that you heard John talk about in this video when we had our board meeting this week and the actions that we started taking. Uh, the second thing is that for all of you that are actually part of this, you can hear some new things uh, from John about the actions he's taking as well. Uh, so listen all the way through. Uh, and at the end, I've got some very special messages for you as well. All right, here comes the interview. So we have John Berta here. We're going to be talking about naked short selling and what CEOs can do to fight this. So hello, John. Hey, Roger. Good morning. How are you doing? Really, really well. And so excited for this call because obviously you and I spoke about what we can be doing given we've got our board meeting. We're going through what we can do with Genius Group. And so we're going to break down this uh, whole conversation into two pieces. One's going to be all about how you went through taking Torchlight, figuring out what's going on here and actually ending up with a merger with Meta, which is close to $2 billion in size uh, and actually getting some big wins along the way. And then I also want to, in the second half, talk about something that's very topical, which is what's going on with the Series A Preferred, uh, what Finner has been doing, what you are now doing uh, in return, because I know a lot of uh, retail investors also interested in that. And then we can also talk about what do, C not CEOs do, but what do retail investors do given the situation as well. So how does that sound? That sounds perfect. Brilliant. Excellent. Let's start with the first one. First one is Torchlight. Uh, when did you start realizing there was crazy stuff happening in the market against your shares? Uh, and take us from that through to when you decided that a merger was uh, a good choice to move forward. Okay. Um, first, just so everybody knows that I am, I'm here on my own capacity. I'm no longer the CEO of Torchlight. I have no involvement with Meta Materials, nor do I have any involvement with NextBridge Hydrocarbons. And we're having this conversation as you and I, Roger, and, and these are my opinions. So I don't want anybody to think I'm speaking on behalf of either one of those companies. So, Got it. Um, but you, but you are you are also a a, a very interested in uh, a very uh, um, concerned investor still, right? Like, in I'm yeah. still a large shareholder, and, and a lot of my friends and family and and acquaintances are large shareholders of both still. So uh, this is very important for us. But um, well, in answer to your first question, back in 2014 is when I first started noticing that. Um, we were being uh, targeted for naked shorting. And that was a result of my inquiry with NASDAQ at the time, as it related to a, um, a short report that we receive every first and 15th of every month and a discrepancy in that, and that was off by about 2 million shares. Without going into a tremendous amount of detail, uh, after uh, inquiring with NASDAQ, my rep got back to me and said, hey, look, you know, the NASDAQ report is wrong. Um, this is news to me as a NASDAQ rep. I thought this was gospel, um, but 
you know, I have to tell you that 2 million of the shares that were reported short two weeks ago have been moved offshore. And since they're no longer in the U.S. purview, FINRA does not count them as being short. Therefore, your short report is basically completely erroneous and useless. And so that was my first uh, aha moment into, you know, being a NASDAQ listed company and thinking to myself, okay, um, you know, I've been told all along that everything that they're going to report to me is exactly how my stock looks. Well, that was clear cut uh, information and um, proof that that wasn't the case. So, and we, um, we now know, I mean, what's interesting is that at that point, 2014, uh, there was, you know, there was others like Patrick Byrne and Overstock saying, hey, look, I'm getting shorted. You know, you know Musk was talking about it at that point. Uh, but right. most people just thought, these guys are crazy. This isn't happening. Uh, and now we know this whole, the whole offshore side of how naked short selling works is a, a huge part of what's not actually getting tracked at all. Well, I think the problem in that is that the um, the attorneys, the SEC counsel that we all have as issuers, as well as the board of directors that we all have, um, you know, we all just have the mindset, well, that can't be right. You know, right. That's, that, that's an impossibility. There's rules and, and laws and regulations for that. Well, the reality is they don't follow the rules and the laws and regulations. So it's just like being a, a, a bank thief. You know, you're going to go in and rob a bank. You're not a law abiding citizen. That's and that's truly what happened to us. And that's truly what's happening to a lot of companies that are in the public space currently. Um, this went on for like six years, right? But until until yeah. 19, 2020, when you decided on what you're going to take as the next step. And 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 when you get to that, I'm super interested because obviously when you were sharing with me, you were at exactly the same point that Genius Group's at now, which was you you were trading at about 30 cents. You had like an $18 million convertible debt. It's kind of uncanny. We're exactly the same numbers, but you couldn't really get to it because you weren't yet having the volume for the price points. So from that point, which is where we're at and we're like, okay, what do we do about this? I'd love you to share the steps you took and what the result was. Well, sure. Uh, let me give you a little history on that too, because I'm sure a, a lot of uh, CEOs that are going to watch this are going to scratch their head and, and think to themselves, oh shit, that's happening to me too. Excuse my language. Um, after 2014 and, and through 2021, when we did the merger with, with Meta Materials, it became apparent to us that all of the things that Patrick Byrne talked about in his videos that are going to happen, happened to us. So you're going to get a, a short and distort report issued about you. There's going to be a massive short position, uh, and then they're going to drop these reports. And then, by the way, uh, there's going to be an investigation open in, on, on your company. All of these things that Patrick Byrne talked about, after I saw his video, I'm like, every single thing he talked about happened to us. So it's not, this is their blueprint. This is uh, not necessarily the market maker's blueprint, but the hedge funds that actually short and distort and try to drive your stock price down in order to cover are talking about. I would argue that those particular uh, short and distorts may or may not actually have borrowed the shares. But typically, the short and distort guys are looking to buy it back in it and move on to the next victim. However, market makers and people who you know really aren't privy to the uh, locate rules um, have no intention of ever covering, and they're naked short. And their game plan is to drive small companies like ours out of business, so they never have to cover, and they never have to report a uh, a sell ticket to the IRS to pay taxes on it. So that that particular business plan is well and alive today. And I would argue that there are probably hundreds of stocks that, that, that that's happening to uh, predominantly in the small cap space. And because companies like ours have to continue to raise money to advance our situation and they know that. And so they take advantage of uh, that uh, pattern of raising capital. Right. But I would argue that it also happens in the large caps as well. If you look at uh, Tesla, for example, and all the trillions of dollars that have been sold short in that, and certainly they've been winning for the last year, uh, but, uh, you know, Elon Musk was able to turn the tide on them, you know, back a few years ago. But, you know, last year they're getting their their uh, their way with uh, things. So I would argue if uh, Tesla ever investigated the true number of shorts and if all of those shorts were borrowed, I, I would argue that they probably find out that uh, there's a lot of shorts in there that uh, are just created out of thin air, stolen, stolen money, so to speak. Sure. So, um now, <clears throat> what's interesting about all this is um, I'm going to kind of get you up to 2020 with all of this. Obviously, COVID hit worldwide. It was a worldwide panic more than anything else. Um, and then we were sitting in a board meeting in May of that year after the uh, the pandemic had started. And I was talking to our board members and saying, look, 
we have a really what we have going for us right now as an oil and as an oil and gas company is we have great assets in a time when oil and gas is you know negative 37. So two things are going to happen. One, we're not going to raise any capital to drill. So we, we're in jeopardy of losing our primary asset in the Oro Grande asset. And two, our shareholders, some 4,000 at the time, need the benefit of, of us acting on their behalf. <clears throat> so we decided at that point to um, take advantage of our basically our NASDAQ listing and our shareholder base and said, look, let's find a company to merge with. We'll keep our oil and gas assets for a rainy day. And we'll give the, our shareholders the benefit of that uh, type of transaction. So uh, fast forward six months, we met uh, Men and Materials in a, uh, a Zoom call. And uh, we basically, after having that call with them and really doing some initial due diligence, signed a letter of intent with them and signed a definitive agreement in December of that year. When we signed the definitive, we had about $18 million in debt. We had, uh, we had the requirement to get rid of all of that debt, as well as uh, come to the table with $10 million in new capital in exchange for the 25%. Um, after we signed our definitive agreement, we had probably five or six million shares short. And, yeah, can, I, uh, can I just add just one thing as well at this point? Because again, I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying as a CEO of a company similar to where you're at right now. And there were two ingredients which you which you overcame by being very creative. Uh, the first one, which is the fact that you saw the value of the company being a high value to someone else who wanted to be a Nasdaq as a company like Meta. Uh, but you also were like, hey, like we've got all these assets, like we've got like the oil and gas going. Um, how do we how do we protect that or at least you know like know that that wasn't the main thing they were buying? And the way you set up Series A preferred to then basically be able to still keep that as a separate company that you know is going to be able to work. Uh, we're going to get in the story in a moment. And then the second thing is the fact that you had to get rid of debt and do a bunch of stuff, which at that point you didn't know how you're going to do, but you just had the courage to go, look, we're, like, like, no, it's not an option. We're going to figure this thing out. Uh, and if you hadn't made that decision, then it wouldn't have become a self-fulfilling prophecy of what then happened after that. No, it was 100%. We, that was the best move we could have made as, as a, a management team and board. Um, and it started to work out for us in December when we signed that definitive agreement. Um, we started to get, we were, like I said, when we merged or we signed a definitive, we were 30, 35 cents a share US and both companies started to get a bid and it started to get a lot of press, started to get people following us. And then we uh, traded up to 75, 80 cents a share at that point. We were able to uh, get $2 million of our notes uh, converted. All of our notes had a conversion feature in them. So we just had to reach a certain point and then to work with those people to get them converted. Um, we announced that, and then a couple of weeks later, we had uh, another two million shares converted to buck ten, and then we had our biggest uh, position, uh, twelve million dollars converted at a, at a dollar fifty. And again, the stock was by that time was trading in the twos, and that lender was happy to convert, um, and um, you know went long and, and actually made you know made made a great return on their investment. So that all, that all happened pretty much what well, between 30, 40 days after the announcement. Yes. And so by middle of February, Super Bowl Sunday, by then we had eliminated all of our debt. And, um, you know, that's when we first did our first uh, money raise with Roth um, to basically accommodate that 10 million. We actually on Super Bowl weekend, we I got a call from the folks at Roth saying, hey, there's uh, a lot of interest in doing a transaction. Um, what do you guys think about raising capital? They told us there's probably, you know, 45, 50 million of, of demand. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to hold just for a second on that one, right? Because you know any CEO who's listening to this is going to be going, wait, hang on, how did you go from basically like not even being able to convert debt to suddenly having fifty million dollars of demand? So one thing I do want to share because we're breaking down. I, I went through some, with you some of these. You were great at sharing what we could do with our board, but breaking down what are the top things you can do to expose or scare away these naked short sellers, and one of them is either doing a spinoff or doing a merger like you did where they know the day is coming, where the brokers are going to have to report who the shareholders are because everyone's going to need to be part of that next step coming. And if everyone knows this is going to be happening, then those who are, have been naked short selling are going to have to get out of that position at some point, right? So I'm just going to give that as an overview because the numbers are mind-blowing, what we, you're about to share. 
But uh, for everyone who's listening, especially CEOs who are listening, this is like really critical to realize this is so much bigger than we think it is. So yeah, carry on with the with the story. You would think that the shorts would be going down at this point and the shorts would be covering, but uh, that's not what happened. Uh, the shorts continued to double down as more people got into the stock, as um, we continued to build our audience. Uh, by the time we uh, got our proxies approved in May, and uh, come June 1st, I think we had probably 65,000 shareholders at that point from 4,000. And our short interest went from, you know, five or six million up to 10 times that, you know, uh, approaching 50 million. And that's those are shorts that were reported. Right. Mind you. And so. And yeah. So, so, so back at the, at the Super Bowl Sunday, when you got that call about the 50 million, um, mm -hmm. I think that that's super interesting. I mean, I never even realized that when you've got these guys going short, that they're desperate. I mean, like, like they'll even come to the company to say, help save us. Right. So how you decided what you were going to do with that 50 million and what, and, and what you were going to do with the guys that, that you weren't going to help and what that then did with your share price. Yeah. So as a CEO, uh, my background is in capital markets and I used to you know be a principal in a fund back in the nineties and late nineties. So I knew um, all about the fund business and I knew um, that bad financings will kill the company. Uh, in our industry, a bad well is not going to kill us, but a bad financing will. So when I spoke to Roth and I let them know that, you know, finally our board has agreed to do something, we basically said we're, we're going to raise $25 million under one circumstance. I get to approve who's in the book. And the reason why that was so important to me is because our stock was trading at $2 three days before this. And then they marked it, they pushed it all the way down to buck sixty, and then came to us and said, hey, we want to do it a buck, deal at buck twenty. Well, when you start to see who uh, raises their hand and asks how much they want, well, one fund wanted the whole thing. Guess how much they got? They got zero. And the reason being is I knew that fund had been shorting us down. And so, um, you know, I, I'm just very adamant about being involved in the money raising process. Because if you don't, your, your broker dealer is really kind of an interesting situation. The investment banker has you as a client, the issuer. But the capital markets desk, their clients are the funds. And so there's a there's a, a meeting of, you know, their their heads kind of butt a little bit mm. because the capital markets guys want to get the best deal for their guys because it puts them onto the next deal. But the investment banker's responsibility is to do the right thing by the issuer. So is there, there's that dichotomy that goes on in a bank. But we were able to look at the book and there's you know, we were way oversubscribed. And I got to pick those people that I knew had supported us in the past and basically said, look, you're getting allocation. And everybody else uh, that came out of the woodwork or that were reg and violators or no, no, known short houses, they got zero. And the reason they got zero is because they, were, they weren't they were looking to invest in our company. They were looking to play the market. Right. And so, um, so they got zero and lo and behold, we announced it on um, Monday after Super Bowl. And the stock, you know, typically what happens when you announce a deal, the stock trades down to that level. But then when people started to actually uh, understand what we did and who we did, did it with, the stock recovered because all those people that were short didn't get any allocation. And so now they had to go back into the market and buy it. And so that was a that was a victory for, for us on that day. We raised the capital we needed. Um, the shoe was exercised. I think we raised $27.5 million, something like that. And everything, everybody was um, extremely pleased uh, with the way it turned out. And then we went back and forth with the SEC for a few months and then finally got our uh, proxy approved and then did our shareholder meeting. And um, it was in June, right first week in June, that we started trading options. So keep in mind, Torchlight at this time had never traded options. Uh, we were getting tremendous volume on a daily basis. We were already heavily shorted. And guess what? There were no shares to borrow anywhere and the borrower rate was through the roof so what do you do you create options and what happens when somebody starts creating options on your company they they do um they pair up puts and calls and create a synthetic share and sell it short and then you know move on and a lot of times they'll just tear up those contracts move on they sold the share short and some some of them will cover at a lower price some will just say you know what screw it see what uh no, you got naked synthetic shorts as well <laughs> Exactly. And what's interesting about that is the OCC is compute, uh, completely aware of this. And, you know, the market makers that actually are market makers for options as well. And there are some big ones, the typical ones you would expect. 
um, they, on the 21st of June, they got a notice from the OCC saying that they did not have to settle their short position, that they were going to try to get the Series A preferred shares to list, to trade, so they didn't have to settle at closing. So I'm going to hold... I'm going to hold on to that story because I know that's a part of a crazy second half here, which is what's happened to the Series A and what you're now doing as a result of what FINRA is doing. Um, let's finish the story on the uh, on the closing of that deal. When you did the deal uh, and everyone had to cover at the end, I think your shares went from something like $2 up to $10 or something because like, everyone was having to yeah, short. It was uh, trading actually higher than that. I think it you know traded up you know, $10, $50 or $11. And through this whole process... And I, and I will tell you today that I don't believe it was short uh, short um, covering. We had a lot of people following the stock and a lot of people that were interested in it. Our shareholder base went through the roof. Right. It was trading three or 400 million shares, um, trading from you know four or five all the way up to 11. Tremendous volume. It's incredible. And through yeah. this time, period, we actually raised via an ATM that we had on file. We raised $140 million dollars above the market price, 14% above market during during that time period. And again, if for all those CEOs that have an ATM out there, you have to be intimately involved. You can't let your broker dealer just sell for you. If yeah. you're gonna utilize an ATM, you have to be watching what's going on and how they're trading it so you don't you know, basically screw your shareholders. So in, in summary, uh, I wanna make a summary for CEOs and also investors of companies where you think this is happening. You went from a place where in December uh, couldn't even you know raise the money to be able to convert the debt uh, or, or, or raise a like volume to convert the debt. You know, announce a deal within pretty much seven months. By June, you had not only uh, got to a one point nine million dollar merger, but you had got the share price from the thirty cents up to as high as ten or eleven dollars. Uh, you had raised. Uh, not just converted the 18 million, but you had raised another 25 million and then another 140 million. For me, that's just mind blowing. And I just want to say a big congratulations that you did this. It's super inspiring for me, who's still like further debt back on that path. Um, but uh, I, I do want to say, hopefully CEOs will take this message already. And if you're part of a company where you've got a CEO who should listen to this, send this to them. But I want to talk for a moment about why more CEOs aren't doing this, right? Because um, it's like, you know, I also with our team, you know, we had to talk long and hard as to whether or not I am even allowed to go talk about this because basically the SEC uh, say CEO shouldn't even be talking about their share price. They should be just focusing a business. Uh, and I've given the analogy that's a little bit like being in the library, getting robbed, shouting thief and basically getting kicked out for uh, not like following the keep silence sign. Right. And so CEOs are like, oh, we better not say anything. And at the moment at, and they're getting robbed right in, in front of them. Right. So what would your advice be for CEOs out there or what investors should tell CEOs in terms of where their priorities are? Is it to, you know, just, you know, play ball with the SEC and Pinera and everyone else, or is it to actually have the shareholders' interest and the company's interest at heart first and do what's right uh, and then, you know, justify it to the SEC and everyone else why they're talking about this stuff later? Well, I, I, would, I think that that's a great question. So first of all, when you're talking about your company, everything you're talking about certainly has to be public information already. That nothing I've ever done or nothing I've ever talked about is, um, you know, goes against what the company has already put out. It's always factual. And if that's my opinion, I make sure everybody knows that's my opinion. Um, but it's really an interesting dynamic because the board and your, uh, your SEC attorneys are gonna tell you, you know, keep your head down, you know, focus on quarter over quarter, this is just nonsense. It'll go away. And the problem is it's not nonsense. And so you you'll find that in situations like ours and yours, Roger, that your shareholder base is predominantly retail. The institutions may have some shares. It's only because it's in some ETF or it's some you know dynamic that they have to be in. They're not calling you up and say, Roger, I want to, I need to buy five million shares of your company. I think you're going to, you know, a billion dollars right. tomorrow. That's not what's happening. Um, so I would say inside of Torchlight, uh, MMTLP, and I, it's my personal belief this is still in, inside of Meta, Meta Materials, that the shareholder base is predominantly retail still. And so therefore, they're looking for their leader to stand up for them and say, hey, <clears throat> I've got your back. I'm going to do everything I can within the law to protect our company because it is our company. It's not my company. It's not the board of directors. It's our company. And so CEOs need to do that. 
And I will tell you, when when I was the CEO of Torchlight, three or four years ago, the folks from Share Intel came to me and said, look, I think you're going to find some interesting things in your stock. We just, you know, we we decided after having board meetings at the end to not do anything. And, you know, we didn't really have the capital, even though it's no, not a whole lot of capital. You know, in a small company, sometimes it's like, oh, that's just, you know, you're going to, you're going to, uh, put 50, 60 grand into investigating that. And it's going to take some time by some people. Well, I'm kicking myself that we didn't do it three years ago. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and of course, if it hadn't been for conversation we had together, the advice of, you know, lawyers like, you know, Wes Christian, who's just unbelievable at his like depth of knowledge that obviously we're both working with, like, uh, I, I wouldn't have the toolbox to be able to then fight all of this as well, right? And this is the same for every CEO that they need this and every investor needs to send like, you know, this information to CEOs so that they realize this is even happening because six months ago, I didn't even know what was going on here. Let's go on to the second part, which sure. is TLP. And um, as you said, like, you know, it was meant to be straightforward where you were going to basically take preferred shares, turn into private company, and then suddenly you're getting traded for most likely the reason you're talking about here. Do you want to just walk through how you found out that was happening and what was going on? Absolutely. So, um, you know, we did the merger. Everything was was fine. Um, we issued the Series A preferred share. And in our proxy statement, it was crystal clear that this preferred share was not going to be traded, that the company was not going to take the steps for the Series A preferred to trade. It was merely a placeholder. Uh, that was issued to all shareholders of record on the date on the record date, and that which means that you were a, a Torchlight shareholder, uh, and you got a one for one share of Series A preferred, and that preferred was going to entitle you to either the proceeds from the sale of the assets, the oil and gas assets, or entitle you to a share of, on a one for one basis if the election was made to spin out the company. So that's where it sat in June. Uh, I want to say 25th, 26th, somewhere around there. That's when the Series A prep was issued. And I, you know, uh, went on my merry way. Uh, Meta Materials took over management. The ticker changed. And I was just basically kind of, you know, semi-retired at that point. And um, it wasn't until probably three or four months later that um, I got a call from my broker and says, hey, your, your Series A prep shares are in your account are now worth $6 million. I'm like, what the heck are you talking about? That's impossible. Series A prep is not supposed to trade. And so um, I got to the hotel, looked up on OTC markets. He gave me the ticker. And I'm like, well, not only is it not supposed to be trading, all of the information on OTC markets is fraudulent. <laughs> it's all my management team from 2012. And so it's got me, it's got uh, our former CEO listed as a CEO. It's got me listed as president. It's got all, all of our old board of directors, a, a website that's defunct, an address that's defunct. Everything on it is pure fraud. Mind blowing. And, and OTC Markets said, uh, and I I have all the records and the receipts. They basically said, "Look, Finra approved it. Um, we're not going to change it. We're not taking it down." And then I do know that um, you know the company at that time, because I'm no longer management, um, the CEO and CFO of Meta Materials inquired along with their counsel as well. And I believe they were told that um, if two market makers got together and wanted to trade this, they could do it. And I, and, I, and I will say, this is my theory on this, is that because we use DTC and because that Series A prep had a QCIP number, we did it for ease of distribution to get this information out to everybody, that they turned around and there was some loophole that allows them to trade it. I don't know what that loophole is, but a loophole doesn't stop you from committing fraud. And so um, we don't know who filed the Form 211. We have our thoughts based upon the first orders of that day and, and tracing where they went, what marker makers they went to. Um, but we'll get to the bottom of that as well. But um, what's interesting about that is a lot of uh, Series A prep holders saw this and they saw liquidity and they said, well, heck, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sell my shares. I might have 10,000 shares. I might have 5,000, what have you. And a lot of people sold their shares, probably two, three, four million shares. Well, you have to think to yourself, why is this trading? Why would somebody go through the right. process of getting this to trade unless they had a problem? It's not just to make a market and make a penny here and there. They had a problem that they needed to solve. When we did the merger, it was my theory that um, there were a significant number of shorts that didn't cover. And now they got they had the responsibility to deliver a share of Series A prep as well. 
And how right. are they going to do that? Well, my theory was confirmed about a year later because I was uh, given a, uh, a PDF from the OCC that basically in clear context and in writing said, we are not going to require you to settle your Series A PREF as part of the dividend because we're going to see if we can get the Series A PREF to trade. Wow. Now, wow. that information only went out to the options market makers, didn't go out to the retail public. And so instead of covering, which they you would think that they would be doing, they were still shorting and shorting into the whole thing. So they, their plan was always there that they wouldn't have to cover and that they'd find a, a, a kind of a, a wormhole to go through and then basically defer it until you're now uh, uh, trading the Series A. And isn't it also right that it would have been a whole lot easier converting to the private company if it wasn't traded versus now that it is traded, which means you've got to go through a whole bunch more uh, paperwork and approvals to even be able to actually convert it all into the private company. Well, it's interesting is that yes, the answer that it would have been a lot easier if everything it would have never traded because um, we have no idea who the shareholders are, who the true shareholders are. Right. If there is a single share that closed short, then you have a single shareholder over here who doesn't really have their share. And so we believe there's, you know, quite a large number of shares that did not cover. Um, I don't want to speculate as to the number. There's a lot of people online that are speculating. That's not, you know, neither here nor there for me. I just know that the number is probably very large. And I, I think it ha has something to do with the fact that in December of 21, we made an announcement, our meta materials made an announcement that there was going to be a spinoff instead of the sale of the assets. So first quarter, uh, Wilson Sensini, who is the counsel for Meta Materials, uh, working with the SEC on the correct way to do everything, after many, many meetings with them, came back and said, look, you need to file an S1. And then when you spin it out, it's going to be a private company with no QCIP and no uh, DTC eligibility. Okay, everybody's on board. Uh, drafting the S1, it finally gets filed in the first week of July. It was quite the document, very lengthy. And um, we go through three or four rounds of comments during this period where our, um, well, actually, let me back up something real quick. When we announced that we were doing a spinoff, instead of shareholders actually selling their Series A preferred, they started to buy. Right. Because they knew there was only 165 million shares that were going to be issued. And instead of, you know, getting 80, 90 cents or a dollar, I'll buy it and, you know, we'll get the oil and gas asset when it spins out. Mm. So it created even more angst for anybody who was short at that particular time through the next whole year. So that would have created angst for them. So um, July, we, we filed our, our S1 registration, goes through three or four rounds of comments, have to update financials, all of that rigmarole. And then through this whole period, we are basically letting FINRA know 60 days notice ahead of time. That, hey, this is going to spin out and this is how it's going to be happening. It's not a dividend. There is no ex dividend date. It is a share distribution. Therefore, when we give you the dates, the last date we give you is the last day is going to trade. We're going to allow two days to settle. And then after the trade settles, we're going to issue shares. That's how it was designed. Everybody was, was cool with it. And then the closer we get to actually filing our final uh amendment to the s1 and our finally our prospectus yeah, obviously there's a lot of people watching the stock at this point um a lot of people were talking about it online and the stock is moving i think the high it hit was a little over 1250 a share on mmtlp um and then when we finally got finra after got getting approval from the s1 with the sec we got like, finally after about 10 days got finra to issue a uh corporate action notice and it was wrong and so our attorneys got with FINRA, argued about it. DTC didn't like it. DTCC said that's wrong. And um, they basically came out and said, this thing's going to trade for two days on the 7th and 8th, and then it's going to go dark. Um, no retail trading uh, on the 9th and the 12th, meaning the only thing in our minds, the only thing that could have happened at that point is a cover. Buy to cover. We're talking. We're talking about December here, right? So this is like six December weeks ago. Twenty-two, right? Now, there's a lot of people's theory about um, you know why they halted the stock, but anyway, long and short of it, if Fender puts out a notice, we didn't really agree with it. They said 
you guys don't have any input. We're doing it the way we want to do it. And then DTCC came out and said, we don't agree with it. We're not going to send it to our broker dealers. We're not going to force this issue with them because we don't agree with you either. And uh, went back and forth, set a, set a meeting for the next morning. Again, this is Thursday, okay? Second day of trading before this is supposed to stop. And FINRA doesn't show up to a meeting. They basically blow off the meeting with our council, DTCC, and FINRA, and uh, ignored the meeting, basically said, we're not coming. They called DTCC on their own without our involvement and basically came out with another notice a half hour before trading stop on that Thursday and changed one word. They changed from canceled to deleted. And the whole process was basically on, it was supposed to be, we're going to trade through the 12th. That's the last day of trading. We're going to eliminate the ticker on the 13th. We're going to allow for settlement on the 14th and then distribute shares on the 14th. So everybody in the world, long and short, knew that these were going to be the days. This was right. it. Okay. So you knew in July, if you're a short position, that you've got however long to cover your short, whether it's a real short or a synthetic or whatever, you've got to cover because this company is going private. And guess what you can't do? You can't hold a short share in a private company. Right. Right. So, I mean, the whole world knew, right? So um, when FINRA and DTCC got involved, DCT just said, you know what? We're not giving this notice to our broker dealers. We're not going to force anything on them because wow. we, don't, we don't like the way that this has gone down. And so obviously at this point, they can see exactly what the challenge is. They can see just how much there's naked shorts or, or how much they just have no way of fitting all these people that say they have shares into the actual real number of shares. Right. And they haven't shared any of that information with you or the public or anything like that. And it's been six weeks of silence at this point, right? Right. And so there's a reason why DTCC and FINRA didn't or FINRA didn't show up to that meeting. They didn't want to disclose how big the problem was. And within that, by that night, FINRA had halted. They said, you know what, we've got a problem. So they basically said in their U3 halt that there could be a potential problem with clearing. Therefore, you know, in order to preserve the market, we're halting. So there is no way in hell on the last day of trading, 13 million shares trading, and it goes from, you know, a high of, I think, on that day, six, six something, all the way down to 290, the last trade. And every single market maker has had 505 listed. And, you know, these market makers talk to each other by what they're putting on their market, right? 505, 505. I need shares. I need shares. Okay. Then <laughs> last day of trading, it stops. And then they halt it that night. <laughs> so all of those people that were short just from that day have not covered. Hmm got the reported shorts then you've got the shorts in the obligation warehouse then you got the shorts in the cns pool then you've got you know it's just it just goes on and on and then all the broker to broker clearing that went on outside of dtcc so we are um ultimately myself and three other gentlemen are getting together uh, with wes christian and his team and we put up the money we've engaged him and um and inside of our llc and you'll see an announcement on that uh, Tuesday uh, that we're... And by the way, this by the time this video is showing, that, that action has going to have been taken, right? Like we're actually like, you know doing this Monday night, right? So you're about to do that. And I got to say, um, again, just talking about what retail investors can do, the fact that it's not even like, you know, the, com the company doesn't even know, I'm talking about the, 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 the oil and gas company that's being spinning off right now, that doesn't even know who the shareholders are uh, next bridge can't actually even make any decision at the moment because it has no sh like you know shareholder list um and at the moment there's actually no uh like certainty coming out of FN or sec as to when this thing will be resolved which means the only way at this point in the world you can get past this is legal action right and and the fact that you as a group of investors are saying well we'll even pay for that to actually move this forward i think is is pretty amazing i know wes is very optimistic on like what's going to come out of this as well um, but I'd love you to just share, based on where things are at, um, what you would recommend to other investors out there that may be in similar situations where where you've actually got uh, only like legal action that's necessary, or there might be other things you can do. And secondly, what do you think is going to be the outcome, or is it too early to say, with what's going to happen in this case with MMTOP? Well, I think the, for the first uh, first question is, if you're a CEO and, or an issuer and you have and you think that this is kind of going on in your company, I would the first thing I would do is get in touch with Share and Tell and do the do the work, do the investigation over 60, 90 days and let them come to you and determine 
you know, where he thinks the problem problems are before you even engage Wes. You know, Wes is a he is a bulldog, but um, that information that's required is only going to help Wes and help him do the job he needs to do. And by the way, that was that was what Wes said to us as well. He says, hey, like, you know, work with Share Intel, get the actual proof. Because uh, the great thing is, like, we are living in a very different time from back in 2014, where we actually have got enough, you know, ability to track and share into a so sophisticated, they they not only know where this is happening, but who's doing it. Uh, and then, of course, Wes can then really take action, which is which is where we're at right now. Right. And I, I think the cool thing about it is there are enough of us who are willing to stand up that we're, you know, there's kind of a strength in numbers, as I say. I know you have a, a big following, you have a lot of shareholders. Um, our MMTLP following on Twitter is just incredible. Um, the amount of people that are you know, really engaged in this. And I think the more companies and more CEOs that kind of come together and shed light on this, the better off we're all going to be. Because at the end of the day, something is wrong and something is inherently wrong when, when, when people are allowed to steal from the American public. And quite frankly, if, you know, if I, knowing what I know now, it's going to be very difficult for me to put money back in the market unless they are able to fix this. It's just not right. It's not fair. It's not, and they're stealing from the American public. And, um, you know, if you and I were to uh, walk down the street and steal a car and, and um, copy the title a hundred times, as Wes says, and sell that car a hundred times, we'd be in jail. And so this is no different. And we're going to get to the bottom of it, hopefully with all of us coming together in numbers. It's going to shed a lot more light on it. People are going to talk about it. Congress is going to talk about it. Ultimately, Congress is the only one that has oversight over FINRA and DTCC. And so... Um, that has to be a pressure campaign on that side of it. And I think that people are starting to take notice of this. It's not um, so buried under the rug anymore. People are, are really talking about this. So um, I, think I, I, I agree. And, and I think that the the way that Wes himself is so much more positive now, because there is, first of all, so many CEOs now that are showing up saying, right, let's share information and actually let's take action and let's stand up for our shareholders. Uh, he's making more inroads also, right? The likes of, you know, SEC, FINRA and what can be done differently, uh, which I'm sure we're going to be all hearing about in the coming weeks as well, which is very exciting. Uh, and I just want to like, just acknowledge you because when I reached out to you, you were just straight back and said, yeah, let's have a call. Let's let's work this out. And the more that we can be helping each other, because every, behind every CEO, behind every company, like in your case, you're up to 65 thousand shareholders, there are thousands and thousands of people that are relying on us making the right leadership decisions for the benefits of them. And that's not even counting the customers and partners and everyone else that each of us work with as well. So it's so, so, so important. I really, really hope that message gets out to more and more CEOs, right? That uh, the retail investors on their own cannot, uh, they can feel the pain, but they cannot resolve it on their own. But with the help of the CEOs and the likes of Wes Christian, uh, we can actually start making some huge differences for all of us going forward. I agree. And then, uh, you know, CEOs stand up for your shareholders They They are, they will go to war for you if they know that you have their back 100%. Fantastic. John, I know we are right in the midst of this. Another chapter is just being written. Uh, I'm looking forward to basically having another conversation once uh, we have the next milestones hit uh, on either one of our sides. But I just want to say a huge thank you for uh, sharing and uh, being so uh, clear about exactly what the steps were but also being so successful so far at actually taking the right actions for yourself and all the other shareholders of your companies. It was my pleasure, Roger. Great um, talking to you over the weekend and again today, and I'm sure we'll be talking a lot more. So um, good luck to you and your shareholders and anything you need from me, be happy to do it. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Thanks, Roger. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you got as much value from this conversation as I did. We took a lot of that information that John shared, uh, what other CEOs like John Frommer have been sharing with me, uh, what Wes has been sharing, and we took it to our board meeting. Um, as a result, we have a number of steps we're now taking, and we're releasing what we're doing at each step to our investors so everyone can know. Uh, at the same time, Jeremy Frommer, who is the CEO of Created, set up and launched CEO Block, which now I am a part of as well, where we can bring CEOs together. Uh, and at the same time, we also have had 
as I'm sure you've already seen, John Berta, who has released the news that he has now got this legal team that is now going to be focusing at fighting the fight for MM. TLP. All of this has happened since that interview took place. Uh, also, what I want to say is that we have got a really incredible roundtable where we're bringing many different leaders of this movement together. Uh, that's going to be on Monday. So if you're watching this before Monday, well, then tune in at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. If it's afterwards, then you can watch the recording because it's on my channel. Uh, we're going to have John who's going to come join us. We're going to have Wes who's going to come join us. We also are going to have Jeremy Frommer who's going to come join us. Plus, we have a couple of other people who've been fighting this fight for like 10, 20 years. Uh, we're going to have Mark Fork, who actually wrote the book, The Naked Truth, and then produced the Wall Street conspiracy movie that many of you have seen. Um, also, the director of that movie is going to be joining us as well. Uh, we have got, uh, in fact, it's going to be the director, Christina Lake Copeland, who is going to be the moderator for that. Uh, and we're also going to have another person who's been fighting this fight, um, and that is Dave Lauer, who runs We The Investors. So if you're a retail investor, you can join his group as well. So what's great is that we've all had different ways that we've been coming to this fight. We're now joining resources together. Uh, we're bringing all the best knowledge, whether it's the legal side, uh, whether it is like what are the actions that we can be taking uh, as retail investors or as CEOs uh, from the point of view of getting the publicity out there. Uh, I really hope that you share the message on to others as well, get others to subscribe as well so that we can really uh, continue to build the pressure uh, to see the change that we all deserve and that we want to see on Wall Street. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you on the next video.